Hey everybody, it's Christy again, back with another interview. And today I have a fellow podcast host. Her name is Bailey and I'm going to bring her out to meet you all. Hey. Hey Bailey, how are you today? I'm good. Uh, that's kind of a lie though. It's been an exhausting week already. <laughs> I know all about it. So I like to start off by giving you the floor to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you have going on. Other than your busy week, of course. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so the background with me is I was diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder when I was 16. Uh, long story short, because it is a very complicated and long story, uh, I found out that my biological dad was, um, he had bipolar 2 disorder. And so I knew something was kind of off with me and I didn't really know what so I asked my mom to take me to a psychiatrist and, you know, get it figured out. And I thought I was doing the right thing, which, spoiler alert, I was. <laughs> uh, although my mom and everybody in my small little hometown of te in Texas didn't seem to think so. And so I struggled with bipolar 2 disorder for almost a decade with just not really knowing what I needed to do or how to get things done. To be better. And then, you know, finally I decided I was not going to live like that anymore. So. <laughs> and that's great. Honestly, some of us take most of our lives to figure out we don't want to live like that anymore. So kudos to you for figuring it out as soon as possible. Um, so you told us you were diagnosed with bipolar two. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I know people see bipolar and they think it's just one generalized disorder, but there is a little bit more to it than that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot more to it than that. And that's one of the things that I have been very, very strong about advocating is because there are a bunch of different types, but the main three are um, bipolar one disorder, bipolar two, which is what I have. And then there's another one. It's called, oh, and I'm totally going to get it wrong, but it's like mixed mood disorder or it's like slightly like they all kind of get like less as you go down. Like so, on a spectrum. Bingo, like a spectrum. Exactly. There's a spectrum of it, just like there's a spectrum of so many things out there these days, and they can't all be generalized. <laughs> uh, so That's bipolar right. one, yeah. So I, I know you know, yeah. Um, bipolar one is they, uh, that disorder has more of the, the psychosis and the more of the psychotic side. And so it, it's kind of similar to schizophrenia. I don't want to say that it exactly is, but it has some of the same similarities. But a lot of times those with bipolar 1 disorder end up being hospitalized. And so I have bipolar 2 disorder, so I've never actually had a full manic episode, which is more of like a psychosis level type thing. And that is the manic episodes. It, that's what gets people hospitalized. But whereas bipolar 2 disorder, we have what's called hypomania. So it's not as intense as mania, but it's still, I, I mean, it's still pretty intense <laughs> compared to the average human, someone who doesn't have either of these. So, right. yeah. And I guess I should probably explain a little bit more bipolar disorder, huh? <laughs> yeah, if you would like to, sure. Take the floor okay. and tell us more about it. I'm like, I'm talking about these crazy words and you're sitting there. I'm like, Ooh, maybe I should give more details. Um, <laughs> so the thing with bipolar disorder is it, I mean, if you think of the polars, like there's the North and the South pole bipolar disorder, there's one. And then there's the other one. So the North pole is like the highs that's hypomania. That's mania. That's feeling good. That's feeling great, but it's not just feeling good or feeling great. Y'all it's like, extreme. It's way more than what the average person would feel when they're feeling good or feeling great. And then you've got the flip side of the coin, which is the lows, which are nobody's favorite. <laughs> and Absolutely that right. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So those are the depressive episodes. And that is very similar to, you know, just regular old depression. And so the difference between somebody having depression and somebody having bipolar disorder is that if you experience depression, but you do not experience um, hypomania or any type of mania, um, any of those type of episodes, then you are not diagnosed bipolar. That's just the general rule of how to differentiate the two. Even though they both have similarities on one end, it's the other end of the spectrum that's missing. So That makes sense. And there is something I'd like to add for anybody watching. There is a lot of confusion when it comes to bipolar and borderline. And there is a very big difference because, yes, just like you have the North and South, we have black and white ways of thinking. 
The difference is when it comes to bipolar, if you're on a forked road, one being, let's say, happy and one being sad, there's a fork in the road. With um, borderline, it's literally just one road and both are at the end. So there's no um, discerning those two feelings. It's all mixed, mashed mess. To, and I just like to clarify that because a lot of the times with people, they think they have borderline or they think they have bipolar, but they're not sure which one. Borderline has symptoms of basically all of the mental health conditions. That's why it's the hardest to get diagnosed with because it has the same symptoms like the psychosis portion, like you said, the mania, the highs and the lows, the suicidal ideations that come with the depressive episodes. So I like to make sure I clarify that, you know, and it's not the first um, interview that I have clarified that just because I want people to be aware so that they handle their loved one or themselves in the right manner when it comes to treatment or coping mechanisms and things like that, because they're a little bit different when it comes to the two. No, absolutely. And I, for one, fully appreciate that because I did something that was like an uh oh, um, in one of, I think it was in season one of my podcast. I ended up saying, I, I shortened bipolar disorder to BPD. And then I realized later, oh, yeah, I know. I read <laughs> somewhere. I read somewhere. See, the internet is not always our friend, you guys, because I read somewhere on the internet that bipolar disorder and they put in parentheses BPD. And so I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to call it that. And then I realized, oh, no, that's not that. So, yeah, exactly. So you're exactly right. And you're you are, you know, spot on with people confusing the two because there are a lot of similarities. And then bipolar disorder, if you do shorten it, BPD, but that's not yeah. what it's called. See, so you see how someone can get confused, even me. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> And for a while, to be honest, I didn't even know borderline personality disorder existed. I thought it was just, I thought BPD was bipolar. Like I thought that's what that meant because not a lot of people know about borderline. That's why it's important to raise awareness on these things. And even with bipolar, I had no idea there was more than one. Like there's more than what? What do you yeah. mean there's more than one? And the same thing with like ADHD. There's like more than one kind of ADHD. I'm like, can't we just like generalize it? And it's like, no, you can't because we all suffer different symptoms. So Bingo. Um, mm -hmm. With that being said, I like to go into the symptoms. Let's get into that. Um, is there anything that you are struggling with with your symptoms? I know you said you got diagnosed, you know, as a as a teenager, which must have been really hard because you're already going through all these emotional changes that come with being. I think you said 16, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So being 16, like I remember 16. I was a hot mess express, so I can only imagine having to deal with going to doctors and trying to figure out my own mind and what I'm thinking while I'm trying to figure out myself as a person. So when it comes to, you know, how early you were diagnosed and where you are now, is there anything that you still struggle with symptom wise? So symptom wise, I will admit that they have gotten a lot less intense. Thankfully, um, a lot of that has to do with lifestyle change and then just learning how to actually cope and deal and manage. I, I like to use the term manage um, my disorder because it's not, I mean, it's not going to get better. It doesn't get better, but I can learn how to do things that are not going to trigger me. And so that's been a huge, huge relief. But something that I struggle with that I don't even, I don't think it would be classified as a symptom, but it's anger. Like I feel, so the thing with bipolar disorder is that most of us, we feel emotions at a much higher intensity than the average human. So that's again, why we have those highs and we have those lows. They're so much higher and lower than everybody else's because we feel things a lot more intensely. And so that comes with all the emotions, guys. When I'm super happy, people gravitate towards me because they can feel it. They can feel how happy I am. But when ecstatic. I'm, yeah, I'm ecstatic. And they're like, wow, what's all this? This is great energy. Let me soak it up. But when I'm angry, it is like I repel people like mosquito spray. Like it, it, it can be <laughs> intense. Like, and it sucks. And it's sometimes it's scary. And to be honest, uh, I've been moving apartments the last 
two and a half weeks. Yeah, two and a half weeks now. Damn. And it has just brought on a lot of stress and a lot of anger. And I have had no time to do any type of self-care. And so uh, was it last night? Yeah, it was last night. I was so mad. I was clenching my fist and I just wanted to scream and I was crying because I was just I felt so much anger and I just had no way to release it. And that's one of the things that I think I guess, I mean, I guess, you know, learning to manage your emotions is a part of a symptom because we have such higher intensity emotions that it's something we have to learn to deal with. And you so. know what? I am so glad that you thoroughly explained it that way, because that is a main um, symptom of borderline, too. That's why they're so alike, because borderline is literally we cannot manage our emotions the same way. We don't feel happy. We feel ecstatic. We're not just angry. We are livid and you should die. Like we're not sad. We're, we should probably die right now. And that's fine. Like that's, we feel so intensely and it's related exactly the same way that you have it. It's just a very deep feeling all of the time. You know, we don't feel sad. We feel grief. Why are we grieving? What are we grieving? There's nothing gone. We're just upset. Like, you know, like, he, he didn't say I was fat. He said that shirt didn't look good on me, but now I'm grieving like I just lost my mother or something. You know, that's kind of how it feels. So it's important to bring that to attention. I'm so glad you were so beautifully. So I just oh, want to say that. <laughs> thank you. So you said that your anger is, you know, one of your main issues that you deal with. Um, is there any, any way that you've seen work the best for you? So far, oh. are you still kind of testing the waters? So absolutely 100% exercise. And so I do it though as like, uh, we have a, a slam ball. I don't know if you know what a slam ball is, but okay. So I do, um, I'm part of this exercise group. It's a bunch of um, high intensity interval workouts. And one of the, the things that we use so sometimes is it's like medicine balls, but it's like covered in rubber and they're heavy and they're like, they're 20 okay. pounds, 25 pounds. And so what I have found what works really great. And that's why we have one at our house now is to grab that thing. And when I'm really pissed, I go outside and you take it and you slam it down on the ground, like into a squat and just do it over and over and over and over again. And sometimes if I'm mad at like a specific person, it's that's their head that I picture while I'm doing it. Interesting. <laughs> I know it's uh, it's not like the best thing to like, you know, tell somebody that I was so mad at them that I was slamming their head in my mind with this ball. But I mean, it works for me. And that's what I need that's to do. Right. That's right. It works for you. So me personally, I don't I don't have the anger portion. Um, I don't get angry. I get irritated, but I don't get angry. But that is a great way. And even if you're picturing their head, whether they know it or not, that's a great way to handle that stress. And your butt must be like, like, on point from all them spots, right? <laughs> it's pretty good. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't need to, I don't need to boast, but you know, <laughs> so, uh, moving on, um, when it comes to having a really tough time and, and high stress environments, a lot of the time people with mental health conditions see, um, an exacerbation of their symptoms. What do you do when there's a high stress environment and you feel yourself on that brink? So a lot of times the, if like, if I'm at work or if I'm in a situation where my, uh, my partner's not around, then I immediately will do breathing exercises. So thankfully, um, little handy dandy Apple watches have the little, um, the breathe that you can sit and do, and it forces you for a whole minute. And sometimes that minute feels like it's never going to end. But I have noticed a huge increase of relaxation in the midst of like chaos. If I'm feeling chaos and I stop, and if I sometimes I'll go and I'll go to the bathroom and I'll just stand there and I'll just do it on my watch and I'll do it one or two times if needed to just calm me down. Because a lot of times what happens is it's a buildup. And even my therapist and my partner, he, oh, he's so good. If he's around and I'm freaking out, he'll come over and he'll like, he'll hug me and he'll, he'll like hold my head and he'll be like, breathe. And he'll breathe with me. You know, like when women go into labor and people breathe with them, that's kind of what it's like. And so <laughs> it works though. It calms me down. <laughs> and that's great that you have that support system. I, myself, I have my kid. He knows this because I also have sensory issues. Like if I feel overwhelmed, I get sensory overload, I start freaking out. You know, I don't like loud noises, things like that. So if I feel overwhelmed, my son will notice and he'll come over and he'll hug me. I'll go, are you okay? And that's oh. kind of snaps me back. Like, am I okay? Like, am I about to freak out right now? Cause you know, no parent wants to do that in front of their kids. And I'm like, Oh wait, I am about to freak out. 
let me step away for a minute, you know? So it's great to have that kind of support system, that live in support system to help you when you get into those moments. Oh yeah. Oh, I love that. And you know, I'm glad you brought up the, um, the sensory overload type thing because I just figured out that that's one of my biggest issues. And so Mm -hmm. I didn't even realize I did some research probably about two months ago because we, I don't remember where we were. We were somewhere and it, it was just, I had to leave. It was so fucking loud. There were so many people everywhere. I was hot and I was like, I have to get out of here. And I was freaking out. And so my, my partner and I, he went and we looked it up and we, figured out it was uh it's auditory and sensory overload and that's yeah. actually a symptom of bipolar disorder that i had no idea no yeah. idea hey so, we learn new things about ourselves every day so yeah i know so you know it's but i will say i thank you for bringing that up because it feels nice to hear that somebody else deals with that too because it's it's intense so i feel you <laughs> yeah it's it's honestly a daily struggle uh people are usually weirded out when they come to my house it's usually very quiet in here um, I don't keep TVs on. I don't, because even a T like say my TV's on in my room and there's a TV on the living room. If there's a cross of those two sounds, it's too much for me and I can't handle it. You know, like something's got to turn off. So yeah. it, it's a big issue. And a lot of people don't realize that they have sensory issues. It could be texture. It could be certain sounds, certain smells, um, yeah. certain, certain things will trigger memories, especially for people with PTSD. So sensory is a big, big, big part of mental health. So it has to be mentioned, you know, so. Yeah, no, you're right. Something that I also realized too, I don't know if this is the same for you, but if, um, have you ever noticed if you're on the phone and you're talking with someone and there's background noise, does that, okay, yeah, I yeah. can't, I can't do I, it. So my, my hack for that, and this is a pro tip, Ooh. and I got it from Five Below, there is a lapel mic. I connect my Bluetooth headphones and my lapel mic, so it eliminates the background noise, at least for me. Um, now as far as headphones, the better headphones you have may do the same thing for their end, but I always tell my friends to get a lapel mic. If we're going to talk on the phone and they're in a loud area or just don't call me until you're like in a quiet area, because I can't handle that either. It's too much noise. Wow. No, that is, a, that is fat. Like that's fantastic because that's the thing yeah. I will, I will hang up on my partner. I'll be like, look, <laughs> I can't right now. Like call me when you're not around a, like a 5,000 people. Cause I just can't, or when you're not opening a goddamn bag of chips, Oh, we're eating the chips, the, the crunching, the crunching. Yes, I can't, I can't with it. <laughs> yeah. So we'll move on from that and I'll go into uh, your achievements. What is the, like, what is something that you're most proud of or your biggest achievement despite your mental health conditions? Going to college, <laughs> that's a huge one. I'm probably going to tear up because I honestly never thought that that was something I would be able to do. Um, when high right. school, when that came along and when I got diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder, I completely just lost all interest and all hope in not just school, but in myself. Like I used to be the little overachiever kid, that little Girl Scout who was annoying, who sold all the fucking cookies. Like that was me. And then when high school came around, bipolar 2 was diagnosed, everybody started looking at me differently and I I believed these people and I I looked at myself differently too and then I thankfully I graduated high school I didn't drop out it was probably close to it (laughs) um I didn't go to college right after I graduated. I struggled for years just making men's eat, uh, making men's eat, making ends meet, (laughs) Uh, living by myself, all those things. And then finally last year, so fall of 2021 was my first semester in college. And I just took one class, but it's a start because you got to start somewhere. And I do have um, my partner to thank a lot for that because he is the one who actually told me like, what, why are you not doing this? You should be doing this. And so he gave me the final push I needed, but y'all, I mean, when depression takes over any of y'all who struggle with that, you know, how hard it is to get things going again, especially believing in yourself. And so that to me, when I finally regained my confidence in myself and my own abilities to do things is just, that's just been one of the most amazing feelings. So, and that, that is amazing. That's great. And I'm happy for you. Uh, I mean, me personally, I did not go back to school, but I had a traumatic incident while I was in college. So that kind of turned me off. So, um, I mean, where I'm at in life right now, it just doesn't seem necessary, but, uh, it is something I've always thought I would go back and finish just to finish it off. I think I'm a semester or two away. So it just kind of feels like, like you should do it just because all these bills you paid off for the school loans and all, like, I feel like it might make it worth it if I at least had a degree, 
But that is amazing because a big, big, big part and a big problem with people with mental health conditions is either holding on to a job for a long period of time or going to school because it requires you to be on the ball all the time. And like you said, we go through depressive episodes. We don't even feel like a person, let alone a person with a schedule and responsibilities. So it's so easy to just turn into a sack or a lump, you know, in your bed or on your couch or in your house in general. Like there was a time I was depressed. I didn't put a bra on for a straight week. And that's not like me. That's how people knew something was wrong. So, you know, it's so easy to just slip away and not even feel like a human being. And that's why it causes a lot of issues when it comes to work or school and things like that. Cause you go through those episodes. So congratulations. That's, it's amazing. Thank you. you. Um, I'm glad that you have somebody to keep you going and keep pushing you and to pull you from your foot off the bed. Like we're not doing this today. Get up, (laughs) you know, cause not everybody has that. So it's really great that you do. You have a great support system. Um, yeah, I will say though, I haven't always had a great support system. And so I, I think that that's another accomplishment in, in itself too, because, you know, I, I mentioned earlier when I was diagnosed with bipolar two disorder, my mom, she was like, so ashamed of it. She definitely, she looked at me differently. My, the rest of my family for the most part did not really my siblings. They were always very empathetic and all of that. But like the adults in the family were just like, Oh, what is this? It, it, we don't know what's going on here but we're not going to research and try to find out. And so I I didn't really have any support growing up or afterwards. And so finding myself and being able to, like I said, like find the confidence in myself, believe in myself, and then, you know, get to a, a healthy place in life mentally where I can find a partner who can also be of support to me. Guys, that is something that I wish for everybody out there, all of you listening and you too, Christy, because it's, it's hard. (laughs) It's, it's hard. And it was a lot of work I had to do. And a lot of it was a lifestyle change, which I know a lot of people aren't willing to do. And so I want to keep reiterating that because it is, it, it really did change my life for the better. And I, I now have what I need because I did what I needed to do for me first. So, right. And you know what? I'm glad you, it's kind of so weird that you brought that you presented it that way because, um, when I got diagnosed in April, that's exactly what happened to me. I, and nobody wanted to do the research on what the hell BPD was. Nobody cared. Me trying to explain my symptoms was just me manipulating or crying for attention or being a little crybaby that didn't want to suck it up, you know? And, and I got cut off and you learn to deal with it the way you have to, you have to keep your head up straight and you got to pick yourself up. Sometimes it, sometimes you are all you have. And I actually had said something and I'll post it. Um, on the page too, I think I might have already where I said, you know, sometimes you got to make your own family and you know, there, sometimes there is nobody, but you at 3 AM or at two in the afternoon or at nine o'clock at night, when you're crying your eyes out and you're at a ball on the floor, it's just you to deal with that and to cope with that and to, to repick yourself up and know that you're worth this, like not the struggle, but you're worth the rebirth that comes from the struggle and you're worth everything that will come to you once you do that lifestyle change that you spoke about. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. So we're like two peas in a pod in that way. And it's sad that we are two peas in a pod that way, because I know we're not the only peas in that pod. And and that's kind of why this podcast exists and why these interviews exist, because we, we need somebody sometimes, and it's not always an option. Thankfully for you know, we're a little bit close in age. So thankfully for the younger generation, they could just go online, you know, right. pop into a chat room. They could pop online, research what the problem is. But I'm sure for you, it must have been very difficult because you couldn't just pop on Google and say, like, what is this? What is going on? Or pop into AIM chat room without blocking the phone line. You know, like we didn't have these options. So, I mean, it's great that the younger generation has that. But it's important also to reiterate that we did not. So we had to learn, you know, to just cold turkey, figure it out, pick ourselves up and do some soul searching and some mental stuff to figure out who we are, what we are and what we're going to do with our lives. So it's important to mention that. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I agree that, you know, it's it's sad that there are more peas in this pod with us, but I hope that with um with you doing this podcast and you know with me with mine that we can help to bring more awareness to people and so that we can stop having so many peas in our pod. <laughs> right. Right. Or the peas in our pod have like extensions of their family with them. So like that's yes. fine. We can all still be in the pod. We just want like their family with us in the pod, like one giant pod. So bingo. Yes. <laughs> yes. So speaking Speaking of your podcast, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? And I'll put it up here for anybody who is viewing after. Absolutely. So um, Distress to Joyful Bailey's Way was created back in 2020. Um, I kind of had this idea. I like to talk a lot and people used to always tell me I should start a podcast. And so after going through a very big transformation, um, not just mentally, but also physically, I, I lost weight. Um, I started, you know, taking my therapist seriously. I got the help I needed mentally. I started doing good things for me for once. Um, you know, doing all these things and transforming my life, I decided, you know, I need to share what I've done with everybody else because I have been through hell and I've also come out of it stronger. Just like you said, when you struggle alone, you come out, there's a, you know, there's the next wave and it just gets better from there. And so my thoughts were, you know what, I need to, I need to tell my story and guide people through what I did and what I shouldn't have done, most importantly. <laughs> so that's kind of what it is. And so it starts out, I kind of tell my whole story throughout season one of my journey of um, starting with my diagnosis with bipolar dis two disorder, and then, you know, all the hell I went through from there. And then it goes on with season two to kind of, you know, do some then and nows and kind of explain how I, I'm I've done better versus, you know, where I was previously. And then season three, which came out at the beginning of this year, is a lot more of exploring bipolar disorder specifically and all of the little things that come with it. So I've actually had a lot of fun because I have been going and doing a ton of research, a ton. That's a I like the audio thing we talked about and the sensory that's going to be coming up in the near future because I'm like, whoa, I didn't even know that that was a problem that I had. Yeah. <laughs> so I have been doing a lot more of that and more of educating, not just from my point of view, being somebody who has bipolar disorder, but also as of like, hey, this is what I need from a support system. This is what my partner does for me. These kind of things, because my goal is that I, like, I know that a lot of people who have bipolar disorder are always in and out of relationships. Like that's a really big issue of staying with somebody because there's so many swings and they're so intense. And my partner and I have been together for almost three years now and he's not going anywhere. And so um, <laughs> being able to like successfully talk about how we manage things because we both have had to learn ways to help help deal with me like both of us and so he we have to come up with you know ways to better phrase things for both him and for me and things I should tell him so that he knows not to do this or not to do that or whatever like code words all kinds of things because you know having bipolar disorder yeah that's a big thing for me but it also affects the people around me and so helping the outside world try to understand both where I'm coming from and what I need from others that's helped me is the next big goal into helping other people to achieve the same kind of success. So sorry, that was really long. <laughs> that's okay. And I'm glad that you said actually something I wanted to point out that our symptoms and our reactions and our triggers, not only are they a, are they're our responsibility, but they affect everyone around us. And that's something that we as, you know, and I generalize that, but I mean, that I feel like I can. It's something that we as people with mental health conditions forget sometimes. Like we are affecting the people around us. Um, and we forget that our triggers are our responsibility, but it is imperative to have communication, which is what you were pointing out, communication. This yes. is my, tr this is my list of triggers. Do you have to follow it? No, but if you want this to work, we need to figure this out. So let's sit down, let's pull out our pens and let's figure it out. Let's hash it out so that we can work together as a family or in a relationship or whatever the case may be that the communication is very important. And again, 
again, again, again, we forget that our behaviors affect the people around us a lot of the time. So I'm so glad that you said that um, because that means you realize it and that's the best thing. So. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And, you know, the whole pulling out your pins thing. So a lot of times what happens is my partner will do something or that'll trigger me or I'll get triggered by something that's completely unrelated to anything. And there's a massive meltdown. And he's like, yeah. what the fuck is going on? And I'm like, I don't <laughs> know what's happening either. And it's just chaos. And so then literally what we'll do is we'll go back later and we'll like when we're both of sound mind, as in like he's had time to cool off which he always needs and I've had time to like you know regroup and recenter myself we'll sit down with clear heads and say okay what happened and we'll dissect an explosion or a meltdown or whatever that I had and try to figure out what caused it because if we can figure out what caused it then we can figure out how to move forward and how to do better and sometimes it's literally because I said something that triggered him or, and then he said something that triggered me back. And then when that happens, like my explosion is 20 times worse than whatever right. his might be. <laughs> yeah. So it's literally what you said. It's communication and taking the time to dissect the problems and understand, you know what? I did this. Let me be accountable for it and let's move forward. So. And there's something I actually want to point out. That's actually a major, major part of dealing with somebody with mental health issues. And you may not even realize how, how important it is. Your husband said, what's going on here. He acknowledged the fact that there's something that triggered you. He noticed the signs. And a lot of the times when people like us, and again, a generalized statement have those episodes, it's a complete, we're gone. We're not even there. There is absolutely no realization, no control, nothing. We literally are in like planet 17 and you're still on three. So it's important that when you're in those situations, the person that you're in those situations with can go, Whoa, wait a minute. What are you doing? So you go, what am I doing? Like it, it brings back that realization. It brings, it recenters you, like you said to go, Oh, so like for me, for example, I get obsessive. I have obsessive love disorder and I have BPD. So I, if I feel triggered, which can happen with the smallest of things with my condition, I will start sending paragraphs. I mean, continuous, long straight, I'm very long winded too. So like I will keep going. And it wasn't until honestly, maybe a couple months ago, the friend of mine was like, what is all this? Like, what, what, why, what is all this? I'm not reading all that. What is going on? And I'll go, I don't know. Because in my head, this is totally normal behavior. When in reality, like, girl, that's psychotic. Like, I would have blocked me, honestly. Like, within the first two messages, I would have been like, oh, no. The three bubbles are still going? No. Block. <laughs> so it's, it's it's important to have somebody who recognizes those symptoms and, and brings you back to that reality. It's so important. And for anybody watching who has somebody with mental health conditions, do not ignore or walk away from your loved one when they are having a meltdown or a symptom. Acknowledge it. We need to be acknowledged. It doesn't matter what mental health condition you have. You need to be acknowledged when you're in those moments because again, a lot of the times we are not there. We are gone. It is literally just the anger or just the sadness or just the explosion or the meltdown. It's never us. Um, so it's important to mention that. And I'm really glad that you said that. Yeah. No, you know what? Just to touch on that just a little bit further, because you are absolutely cor correct with the acknowledging and the whole, we are not here. This is not us. There's no control. So actually I, um, I have an episode of my podcast, not a bipolar episode, um, <laughs> an episode of my podcast called, um, that's not me. That's bipolar disorder. And it literally talks further about how, when I, I'm dealing with an episode and same with anybody else who deals with bipolar disorder. And it sounds like also same with BPD. It's, it is, it's yeah. not me. I'm not doing this. All of this fucking anger that's being directed at you. I'm really not mad at you. I'm fucking mad at the traffic out there that I just sat in for an hour and a half or some other complete bullshit that has nothing to do with you. But my anger is just there and it comes out on whoever is around me first. And unfortunately, yep. that's my partner a lot of the time. So he gets like the really ugly side a lot. And so something that really helped him understand that I'm not screaming at him. I'm mad about something that has nothing the fuck to do with him is 
first of all, explaining to him that like during these episodes, I'm, I'm not in control. I, I'm just not here. And you being able to recognize that and kind of acknowledge it will help both me and you. But also we did this crazy thing. I say crazy because it, it looks kind of crazy. It did. It was in the old apartment, but um, I literally put up posters in every single room of the house. And it said, that's not Bailey. That's bipolar disorder. Every single room. And I, I kind of felt like it was like crazy. Cause I'm like, man, this is everywhere in the house. And those posters weren't for me. They were for Monish. That's his name. And they were for Monish. And he, he actually told me about a month after I put them all up, he goes, he looks at me. He's like, thank you for putting those up in the house because it reminds me that when you're, you know, acting in ways that I don't like and that I don't appreciate because it's all directed towards me, it reminds me that it's not you. It's bipolar disorder that's doing this and it can help ground me so I don't react to you reacting to whatever you're reacting to. So that way. Right. Yeah, that was a major thing that like if any of y'all listening, I highly recommend y'all find ways to like signs, like sticky notes, something to remind you because it is so important not to take on what's happening to the person in front of you who is in an episode. That is not you. That is not your problem. They're not they're not trying to harm you most of the time. They're just dealing with something and if you take that on, now we got a huge tornado versus if you can stand there and stay grounded while that person's going through it and you can help them, it makes a world of difference, y'all. A world of difference. Right. Right. A lot of the times when you're the partner to somebody who has a mental health condition, you're their safe space. Um, that's ex There's no better way to put it. You are their safety. You are their comfort. You are their rock. So you are the one that's steady. You know, you can't have two people with mental health conditions together. It never works. There has to be someone who is steady to go, whoa, what's going on? And I'm glad that you said something about sticky notes and posters, because, for example, for me, I had a little chart and it had like a smile and a frown and a couple in between. It was like, how am I feeling today? Is it this or is it this? That wasn't for me. That was to warn whoever came in the vicinity that this is what's going on today. We're either going to have a good time or a bad time. It's entirely up to you whether you enter the vicinity, you know, um, and that's very much helped you know, with me, with uh, either roommates or my son or things like that. And he does the same thing. So with borderline, I really don't know emotions. I know happy, sad, and angry, and really that's it. So, and I feel things very deeply. So I have like a little wheel on my phone. I know this is embarrassing because I'm like in my thirties, I have a wheel on my phone that has like all of the emotions. So I'm going, mm, it's that one. So that way I know like how I'm feeling and how to express it. And because I do this, like my son is overly expressive. Mom, I am furious. Like, you know, he's just very expressive with his different kinds of emotions and he is not afraid to tell anybody. And that's great because I know that he's not going to have borderline, maybe a lack of a girlfriend, but definitely will not have borderline. So, you know, having those charts and things like that are so important for the people around you because again, they're affected by our behaviors. And like I said, they're our safe space. So we want to make it as easy for them as possible so that we have the opportunity to have husbands and boyfriends and things like that. Um, that's, yeah. that's really, really important. No, I love that. And I love, so the, I like lit up when you said emotion wheel, because I was told by my therapist like two months ago, I need to look one up because I don't have the vocabulary for my emotions either. Yeah. <laughs> so you're not alone. I'm, I'm struggling with you on that too. <laughs> well, I will send it to you when we're done here um, yes. because it has helped me immensely. A lot of borderline is we can't decipher emotions. You know, we know like the top ones and that's about it. And, you know, when I got diagnosed, I had to sit down and do the research and find the wheel and sit there and read it over because a lot of the times I don't have someone to tell me what I should be feeling. And I know that sounds weird the way that I put it or feel normal, but a lot of the times what helps people with mental health conditions realize what they're doing isn't average or normal, so to speak, behavior is the people around them. They're going, I feel really, really mad right now, but nothing's around me. They're not mad. Nobody else is mad. So why am I mad? That brings the realization. So nobody has to directly express like, why are you mad, bro? Nobody has to do that because you're seeing it from the people around you. But when you're like me, you know, I'm a single parent. It's just my kid. There's no one to gauge whether or not I'm acting a fool or not. So it's important to have those little pocket, you know, pocket things to express how you feel. 
Yeah. Oh my God. You know, if I had one of those when I was a teenager, man, life could have been a lot easier. <laughs> same, same. I definitely agree. Um, so, and, and a lot of our uh, behaviors and our symptoms and the way that we deal with them as adults and moving into young adults is because of the way that we were treated or the way that people responded to us when we were younger. For example, my family has a generational curse of emotional avoidance. Suck it up. You don't know what tired is, that kind of stuff. So I had no idea how I was feeling or if what I was feeling was valid because I didn't know what tired was apparently, you know? We just walked two miles, but I have no idea what tired is. It must be more than this. So this must just be nothing. So, you know, it's important to have these tools and these things in our back pocket because again, most of the time it's just us and we have to learn to deal with it and our triggers because they're our responsibility. We have to deal with it alone. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So to wrap it up, I just want to give you the floor to give any kind of advice or anything you'd like to tell someone who may be struggling or maybe trying to figure themselves out or, or have a loved one that has the same symptoms or conditions that you do just to help them out or give them a word of encouragement. Yeah, absolutely. So for any of y'all who are personally struggling, my biggest advice is to find a way to fit therapy into your budget. I know it's expensive. I know it can be hard, but y'all like I have seen a, a significant amount of improvement because I have a therapist to guide me through things. Somebody who sits there, who holds the space for me and who listens and gives me actual real advice that it's not just like something I found on the internet. Like they, she's listening to what I am currently dealing with, my current situations. Like there's been so many times that I, I'm stubborn and I'm like, if I get pissed off, a big thing I know that I've heard with bipolar disorder is we will burn bridges. Like we are fucking done. We're angry with this person. We're out. Yeah, snip. exactly. Mm -hmm. snip. Exactly. And so she has helped me significantly with learning how to better deal with relationships instead of just saying, you know what? No, I don't have to deal with this because that's my attitude most of the time. And so because of her and the work I've done with my therapist, I have been able to find a loving partner. And I don't think I could have done that without her help in me figuring out me. Guys, we can't do this alone. If you are struggling with any kind of mental health and you're not sure, uh, start with a psychiatrist to get some kind of formal diagnosis and then get yourself a good therapist. But when I say good therapist, dude, you need to shop around because not every therapist is going to be like the first one you find is not going to always work. It sometimes does. But that's a big thing I've heard with people. They say therapy doesn't work. And I'm like, okay, but like, did you try more than one therapist? Because when we go get our hair cut, we don't stick with the same hairstylist always, do we? No. So <laughs> like, that's, that's my big thing is like, find a therapist who works for you. Somebody who can understand where you're coming from. Like if you're a dude, you should probably have a dude therapist. I, I've heard that, you know, the same gender or the same ethnicity, all of those things can be very valuable because somebody who can actually understand from your shoes and your perspective. So that's the big thing I have. And I want to encourage everybody and remind you guys that seeking help is a sign of strength, not weakness. So going and getting help means that you are super strong and brave and you're doing a great thing for yourself. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on and get, letting us interview you, Bailey. You've had so much information that I'm sure a, a bajillion people are going to find valuable. I can't thank you enough. Yeah, no, this has been great. Thank you. I've enjoyed this. And I've also enjoyed learning more about BPD that I accidentally quoted wrong in one of my seasons. So <laughs> We'll forgive you for it. We'll forgive you for it. So Thanks. I'm going to drop you out now, but thank you again. And I'm going to make my closing remarks and I'll talk to you in a bit. Sounds good. All right. See ya. So to summarize, there are a lot of mental health conditions that have the same symptoms, but just as Bailey said, you can either have the support system or do it yourself. Either way, it's got to get done. Your, your symptoms and your responses to triggers, they're your responsibility. But with therapy and with a good support system, you can manage and you can heal and you can be a better and more productive person. So another thing I'd like to say about therapy to add on a little bit to what Bailey said is therapy is a safe space too. It's somewhere you could go. You can be 
yourself, whether that self is a little bit crazy or not, because they're going to guide you and they're going to help you better understand yourself, your symptoms, and what you can do to make your life easier and make it more manageable. And they will also guide you when it comes to relationships and how you're feeling and things like that, because we all want somebody to go home to. That's a fact. It's a statement of fact. Um, but without therapy and without working through what you're thinking with somebody who is qualified to help you, I'm not talking about your girlfriend who encourages you to key your ex-boyfriend's car. We're not talking about her. We're talking about a medical professional who is trained to help you in those situations and to better understand yourself. It's so important to have that. I highly encourage it too. And like she said, shop around. We don't go and test drive one car and drive off the lot with it. No because we're putting a lot of money in that car, right? Well, this is our mental health and this is all we've got for our entire lifetime. So you need to shop around. If one doesn't work, try another. Just don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on your treatment and stay strong. All right. And with that being said, I'm going to end the interview here. Check out Bailey on Instagram. It's up on the screen and also check out her podcast. I'm sure you'll learn a lot about yourself and I'm definitely going to check it out right after this. So have a good day, guys, and I hope this was helpful, and feel free to reach out if you need someone.